thank you very much kerala branch for inviting me again for the isacon conference in the kerala which is a dynamic branch one and i am always been a part it's a proud moment for me and today what i am going to speak on is and neuropathic pain a current understanding as well as the management as far as ihsp definition of the pain is concerned pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of damage this is one which is a famous definition of ihsp when let's come to the neuropathic pain or the types of the pain the types of the pain mainly are two types that is a nociceptive pain and a neuropathic pain nociceptive pain is the one which is a basically an acute pain which happens normally because of the injury or the surgery where you can find out that the main cause being the post operative pain or any trauma or sports injury these are the things which leads to the acute pain while the neuropathic pain is the one which is initiated or caused by the primary lesion or the dysfunction in the nervous system and the main causes for that being the post operative examples you can see post operative uh, post herpetic neuralgia neuropathic pain then uh, diabetic polyneuropathy then central post trach and crps and all those things and whenever these two things are combined that is nociceptive and neuropathic pain is combined it leads to the mixed type of pain let's come to the prevalence and incidence of the neuropathic pain the ground reality being it's many times it has been ignored as you can see over here 20 to 24% time the diabetic people experience a painful neuropathy while a patient on the herpes zoster problems they have got a post herpetic neuralgia 25 to 50% time a patient who is suffered from ca breast they go for a post mastectomy pain or a pmps type of pain in more than 20% time and one third of the cancer patients suffer from the neuropathic time of the pain so this is very important one the possible mechanism as of now it is not been completely understood or not been clear but still the possible mechanism being either there is a spontaneous hyperactivity which is deafferentiation type of or afferent input which is the cause of the regeneration and there is a loss of inhibition also that can happen as a segmental level there may be ectopic or abnormal impulse generation which can be because of the neuroma or the dorsal root entry etc or the reflex muscle spasm these are the possible mechanisms which is being blamed for the neuropathic pain formation the description how it is being described the sensations are very interesting one that is it starts from numbing tingling numbness burning sensation paresthesia or it may go to the shooting pain deep or dull type of pain while the signs and symptoms are very classical of the neuropathic pain that is allodynia where you will find that pain from a stimulus that does not normally evoke the pain for example putting up the clothing or even a light touch can cause a severe type of pain or a hyperalgesia where you will find there is an exaggerated response to a normal painful stimulus also or there may be hyperesthesia dysesthesia or any type of feelings for the pain or the normal touch also can go haywire now the current challenges that are being faced in the neuropathic pain are as you can see the treatment part that is been offered till date is been sub optimal maybe because the neuropathic pain has been under diagnosed while the evidence based treatment as far as anti epileptic drugs or tricyclic antidepressant are considered it not been well prescribed the patients often do not respond so well to the anti epileptic drugs or tricyclic antidepressant and patient has to be treated for a pretty long period also so it is very important for us to address the health related functional impairment also which is very much associated comorbidities are there with the neuropathic pain that always affects the quality of the life as well as functional impairments and as i already discussed to you how it is been under diagnosed while as far as treatment is concerned it is been under treated or rather the genuine indications of the neuropathic drugs are not been given for example as you can see over here as it is been red mark that is non narcotic analgesic nsaids etc are being given 41 to 21% patients while these are not the genuine drugs so then genuine drugs being the anti convulsant anti depressant which accounts for only 13 to 14% that's the reason the neuropathic pain is not been very well treated so what is the goals of the treatment before we go to the goals of the treatment we must also assess the properly the attack before we diagnose so we must achieve a proper assessment for diagnosis we also should know what is the underlying cause of neuropathy is it a diabetes or is it a vitamin b12 deficiency we also should see the comorbid condition like diabetes and all other things or cancer we also should assess the psychological status functional status etc only after that only we can set the goals so assessment also is important as far as the 
onset duration, location, distribution, quality, aggravating factor, relieving factor, and mood emotions. These all play a very vital role. But at the same time, pain assessment or pain measurement also is very important. The standard being the VAS score or the, even the color scale or the warm becker scale for the children, which is a standard one also used for all types of pain, whether it is post-operative pain, cancer pain, or the neuropathic pain. But to be very specific for the neuropathic pain, these are certain scales which are very specific to the neuropathic pain. Only thing I don't have time that much to describe all in details. Like this is a lance, which is a lead assessment of the neuropathic pain and symptoms. Then there is a DN4 that is Dolrox and uh, neuropathic four questions. Then neuropathic pain questionnaire, pain detect. These are very specific uh, scales, which also tells us very much specificity and sensitivity as far as the assessment as well as the treatment part or post-treatment response is also was. Now, in clinical assessment, it's also vital to read or to understand about the neurological history, how much is the onset and progress of the disease, then what are the possible etiological factors like diabetes, alcohol, vitamin D, visual deficiency, or is it a cancer or environmental toxicity or trauma? Then we should also have an examination of the sensory and motor system and autonomic system in particularly the patient has got a temperature changes or the sweating or the nail and hair growth which have become dull or skin color this also plays a very important role as far as the autonomic combination of the neuropathic pain is concerned then there are certain diagnostic tests also which are very much useful for the neuropathic pain apart from the blood studies and x-ray ct mri that is electromyography nerve conduction velocity quantitative sensory testing etc but they also have got a limitation whereby in acute injury type it has got insensitivity as far as emg and ncv is concerned similarly you may not be able to rule out the neuropathic pain even if you get a normal result so it is very difficult to diagnose the neuropathic pain in spite of all these tests also but how is the approach for the treatment of the neuropathic pain basic aim is to break the chain of the signs symptoms and pain so before that, we should diagnose completely well. Thereafter, we should treat the underlying condition like diabetes or vitamin deficiency or the cancer. Thereby, we can give a symptomatic treatment also, or if possible, we can do a prevention also of that. Thereby, we can reduce the pain. And once you reduce the pain, there is an improvement in the physical functioning. There is improvement of the psychological status and the quality of the life. There are a lot of options available, but the main options being the pharmacological treatment only, which plays a very vital role as far as the management of the neuropathic pain is concerned. The main important thing being the anticonvulsant and antidepressant. Of course, topical analgesic also plays an uh, important role as far as uh, post operative neuralgia and the specifically limited pain is concerned. Opiate NSAIDs also act more or less as an adjuvant instead of acting as a main treatment part. Uh, this is the uh, board of the actions of all the different type of uh, analgesic or the treatment plan like in the peripheral system in the peripheral sensitivity if you find over here in all places anti-conversion plays a very vital role where is peripheral sensitization central sensitization all those things are concerned while in periphery even local anesthetic topical anesthetic tricyclic also plays same thing about central uh, sensitization anti-conversion opiates and tricyclic while at the brain level, even anticonvulsant and opiate play a very vital role as far as treatment is concerned. While what are the FDA-approved treatment plans for neuropathic pain? The or, uh, carbamazepine is being approved for the trigeminal neuralgia, duloxetine for the peripheral diabetic neuropathy, carbapentine for post operative neuralgia, lidocaine patch for the post operative neuralgia again, and pregabalin for the peripheral diabetic neuropathy and post operative neuralgia. Let's go for the individual one. Carbapentine is the FDA approved for the post operative neuralgia. The mechanism being it modulates the alpha 2 delta subunit voltage gated calcium channel in the central nervous system. Thereby, it acts as far as the uh, pain relief for the neuropathic pain is concerned. Only problem with this is it has got a limited absorption in the stomach as well as intestine, mainly because if there is a food being taken, then the absorption is very less because it has been found that even if, as you can see over down here, the doses can be given from 300 to 3600 but still even if i give you 3600 the only effective absorption will be maybe 2000 or 2200 milligram only rest of the things are that means of 60 percent is absorbed 40 percent goes wasted when it is taken with the food that's the reason it has been found that even if you give a higher dose the effectivity is less 
but still the peak effect starts between two to three hours. Well, pre-cabaline is the next generation one, which also has got a same mechanism that is Alpha Delta subunit, but it has been indicated in diabetic peripheral neuropathy, PHN, and fibromyalgia. And only hypersensitivity is the contraindication. The starting dose here is 50 to 70 milligram, either OD initially or HS, and thereafter we can go on increasing slowly to 150. Sometimes we may have to go for 300 milligram also. And the beauty of this drug is it gets absorbed almost 90% with food, without food also. That's the reason it is very effective within three days, while as far as the other uh, gabapentin, it takes about seven to 14 days for its action to start to be seen. Only problem with the pre is it is eliminated primarily by the kidneys. That's the reason you have to assess the renal function. That is either you have to assess the creatinine test and all those things. If creatinine level is high, we may have to reduce the doses also for the most commonly this has been seen in the uh, anti-cancer drug which has got a renal effect also. So that is the one important thing. The adverse effect being dizziness or blood vision also can occur with pre but it is most popular as far as neuropathic pain is concerned. While antidepressant also play a very vital role, it has got a multiple mechanism apart from in, I mean, sedation and all those things. It also has got an anti-tingling effect and it has been found to also have an analgesic effect. That is how it is born most effective. The dose that is started with is 10 milligram amitriptyline. It can be increased to 25 milligram HS. Rarely it can be given even BD or TDS also. The adverse effect being it can produce dry mouth, sedation and all those things. But still, this is the one which has been always combined together with either even opiates or uh, anticonvulsant drugs. Uloxetine is the first FDA approved drug for diabetic peripheral neuropathy. The mode of action is again, uh, it basically has got an increase in the 5-HD level and not epinephrine level. That is how it works very well. It's available in the capsule form, but remember, it should not be crushed, chewed or broken. The dose is 60 milligram BD. The onset starts in one to four weeks. That is affected. It can produce nausea, sleepiness and all other things. Only remember, it can be contraindicated in myo-inhibit patient on myo inhibited drugs, glaucoma or hepatorenal insufficiency. Opiates, as I was talking to you earlier, actually it is not a primary drug to be given as an analgesic. It basically acts as an adjuvant, but still in the higher doses, it acts very much into the central nervous system, thereby it produces a higher type of analgesia. So that's how it is being used, though it is being controversial, but still it is being used quite popularly. The most common that is being used being the methadone, which can be given in the dose orally also in the 5 to 10 milligram in the dose four times a day or it sometimes can be given in the parenterally in the neuropathic pain. Topical treatment also plays a very vital role, as I told you, in the peripheral post-herpetic neuralgia. The drugs being the lidocaine patch, which is 5% or capsaicin cream also, or EMLA or transdermal fentanyl. Fentanyl again being an opiate. The difference, I'll come to that a little later, but let's see first the capsaicin cream, which is 0.075 milligram. Basically, it is a red chili powder only. It works by depleting the substance P, which is the main reason for the conduction of the pain or the formulation of the pain, particularly the unmyelinated C fiber. That is how it uh, acts very well. It has to be tested in the clinical trials a number of times. This cream needs to be applied four times daily to the affected limb only. It acts only locally. It may cause initially a transient burning, but thereafter patient gets used to it. It works very well. As far as the topical drug is concerned, there are two drugs, that is topical lidocaine patch or transdermal patch. The transdermal patch can be applied anywhere in the part of the body, which it basically acts centrally. So it can be acted even if you've got a lower limb, but it can be applied to the just subclavicular lesion, while the lidocaine patch has to be applied for the post hepatic neuralgia at the site where there is a directly pain or the painful site. Only there it acts very well. That's the only significant difference. Only remember that lidocaine patch can be three times, uh, it can be applied three patches in over a period of uh, 24 hours. But they say once we apply three patches, we have to see that 12 hours on and 12 years off, 12 hours off. That's been FD approved. It plays a very vital role as far as neuropathic pain in the peripheral nervous system is concerned. There are three RCT trials which have shown that it is very effective in post neuralgia. The side effect only is a local side effect. Normally, it doesn't produce much more side effect systemically. 
Now, interventions also play sometimes very vital role, though it is not been popular, unless you know that it's a CRPS 1, 2, in which condition we can definitely go for a sympathetic block. Or if we know there is a single nerve that is being affected, we can also give an alcohol phenol neurolysis or radio frequency ablation also. That also can work. But still, if all those things work fail, or if it's a systemic type of a general wide distribution one, then you can go for a spinal cord stimulation or peripheral nerve stimulation also, or we can go for the intrathecal pump also, spinal cord pump also, which also works very well. So that these basically pumps and uh, nerve stimulations, they basically go on stimulating the nerve at the time of the pain so that it releases all the pain relieving uh, local uh, hormones. That's how it produces the pain relief. So this is spinal cord stimulation which has been indicated in the neuropathic pain, complex regional pain syndrome, post-laminectomy pain, adenoitis, or even the failed back surgery syndrome. Here, as you can see, the, what you call the cathodes or the, these things are stimulated, stimulant are being put directly at the site where the pain originates, so that whenever the patient gets a pain aura, he will just press the button so that the, there's a stimulation of the spinal cord over there which releases the hormones and thereafter attacks to relieve the pain. There are some non pharmacological options like acupuncture, tens. These things are being useful only in the local pains, whether it may be myofascial pain or it may be just a, a phantom limb pain, etc. But otherwise, general type non pharmacological options are relaxation therapy, biofeedback. Here, of course, only problem is patient has to trust on the meditation or relaxation. Only then it works. So to summarize, chronic neuropathic pain is a disease, not a symptom. The rational polypharmacy is often necessary, whereby we combine the peripheral as well as central nervous system agents, whereby it acts to add on a good amount of pain relief, with the treatment goal being balancing the efficacy, safety, and tolerability, reducing the baseline pain and pain exacerbation, and thereby improving the function and the quality of the life. This is very important. Thank you very much.